Viewers are warned that this video contains themes of torture, murder, and sexual assault. All the information in this video is researched from publicly available sources and every effort has been made to ensure that it is accurate or that any implicit bias is stated. Any clips used are protected under the YouTube fair use policy. The intent of this video is not to glorify the horrific crimes of Steven Lorenzo and Scott Schweiker, but for informational, educational, and documentary purposes only. On the 6th of January, 2004, police find the body of a young man decomposing in an SUV outside of an apartment complex in Tampa, Florida. This grisly discovery comes after the disappearance of another man on the 20th of December, 2003, whose body would never be found. The investigation that followed would be the unraveling of two of the sickest killers that Tampa had ever seen, who terrorized the gay community with their brutal murder and dismemberment of gay men in 2003. Due to their obsession with the sexual torture of their victims, the pair would fuel each other's fantasies past the point of no return. Welcome to the worst of us. For today's story, we're headed to Florida. It was October 2003 when Scott Schweiker moved from Chicago to Orlando. He had turned 38 that year and was finishing a course to be a personal trainer. Schweiker was a user on a Dom Sub website for gay men under the username Master Scott, and it was through the website that he was introduced to a user called Dom Dude for Sub, who was a Florida native and so would now be closer since Schweiker had moved. The two men shared interests in BDSM, particularly the Dom Sub relationship. They were fascinated with the idea of the dominant controlling and torturing the submissive in a sexual context. Transcripts of the messages exchanged between them during this period contain a plethora of anecdotes and fantasies including, but not limited to, slipping the date rape drug GHB into men's drinks, tying men up to have sex with them, inviting other men from the internet to sexually assault tied up men, having sex with men as young as 15, and even shooting guys up with a syringe of semen. In the first week of December 2003, Schweikert traveled to Tampa to meet the user that he had been talking to in person. The man was Steven Lorenzo, a Tampa resident who was a little older than Schweikert and had more experience in their mutual interests. Where Schweikert had fantasies, Lorenzo had real-life experiences and he promised to bring Schweikert into his world. Prior to Schweikert's arrival, Lorenzo had made contact with another man online and set up that the three would meet with the intention of participating in a Dom Sub experience where the third man would take the role of the submissive and Lorenzo and Schweikert would dominate. This man's name is disclosed only as O'Rourke by police. Lorenzo and Schweikert met O'Rourke in a parking lot where they talked through car windows for about five minutes before heading back to Lorenzo's place. There is no insinuation of drugging in this incident, as O'Rourke was a completely willing participant. Schweikert describes how it wasn't long after they arrived at Lorenzo's place that O'Rourke was tied to the bed with leather restraints. Towards the end of the session, O'Rourke became uncomfortable and they had to stop. He claimed to the police that this was because he had a rod inserted into his and was being sexually assaulted by Schweikert while Lorenzo used caressing and calming techniques on him. Schweiker claims that O'Rourke didn't say anything about the sexual assault at the time, and the three parted ways without any feeling that lines had been crossed during the session. Schweiker returned to Orlando that same morning. On the afternoon of Friday 19th of December 2003, Scott Schweiker returned to Tampa. He met Lorenzo and the two hung out in the city before heading out for drinks at about 9.30pm. They went to a bar for a single drink and then headed to the 2606 Club, which was one of the premier gay clubs in Tampa at the time. They were supposed to meet with some friends who were in Tampa for the weekend that night, but they didn't show. Towards the end of the evening, Lorenzo introduces Schweikert to a man who he said wanted to come back to the house to play around with them for a while. Schweikert recalls knowing that this was going to be a sexual encounter rather than a dom sub experience because of the way the man carried himself. The man was Jason Galehouse, although they did not know him by name that night. He was 26 and grew up in the Sarasota area, moving to Tampa in late 2003 to live with friends. He talked to his mother every few days and is described as an outgoing and charismatic young man who enjoyed crooning classic songs like I Heard It Through the Grapevine. He worked as a florist and was taking college classes to further a career in interior design. When Schweiker, Lorenzo, and Galehouse arrived at Lorenzo's house, 
Lorenzo went to the bathroom while Schweiker and Galehouse made out in the living room. When Lorenzo returned, the three started to engage together, moving to the bedroom. Exactly what happened next isn't completely clear, but Schweiker claims that he went to the bathroom and then returned to find that Lorenzo had Galehouse in a chokehold. Galehouse's legs were kicking, and Lorenzo asked Schweiker to hold him down. Schweiker holds Galehouse's legs in place, and after a few minutes, the kicking stops. Schweiker checks the body for a pulse, but Galehouse is non responsive. Lorenzo asks Schweiker if he'll help dispose of the body, and Schweiker agrees. The men carry Galehouse out to the garage and dump him onto a tarp. They dismembered his body with a sawzall power saw, cutting off the limbs and head and putting the pieces into six separate bags which they scattered throughout Tampa. Both men now claim that the other used the power saw. The next night, on the 20th of December 2003, the two men again returned to the 2606 club. There, they met Michael Wachholz and convinced him to come back to Lorenzo's place. Michael Wachholz had moved to Tampa from Tarpon Springs only a few months before and waited tables at the Bahama Breeze restaurant. He did not speak to most of his relatives but had recently resumed contact with his mother in Missouri. He is described as a friendly, outgoing type who liked nightlife but was private about his personal affairs. He followed Lorenzo and Schweiker to Lorenzo's place in his own vehicle driving behind them as they led the way in theirs. Once the three arrived at Lorenzo's place, it was Schweikert's job to distract Wachholz while Lorenzo made him a drink. Schweikert claims he went to the bathroom but heard calls and rushed back to see Lorenzo on top of Wachholz, who was screaming, this is not consensual. Schweikert held Wachholz down while Lorenzo grabbed a can of Maximum Impact, an inhalant popper that contains ethyl chloride and is associated with numerous health risks. Lorenzo sprayed the can into a handkerchief which he held over Wachholz's face until he became unconscious. They stripped Wachholz and put cuffs on him. He woke up naked and face down on the floor. Schweikert then covered his mouth with duct tape so he couldn't scream. At some point during the sexual assault that followed, likely due to the combination of maximum impact and GHB in his system, Michael Wachholz had a convulsion and stopped breathing. Disturbed by the dismemberment the night before, they decided not to cut up his body, but instead gathered his effects into trash bags and put them in his car. They wrapped up his body in a bedsheet and put everything in his Jeep. They drove the Jeep to an apartment complex and left it there, wearing gloves to avoid leaving fingerprints. Schweikert would later tell police that Lorenzo seemed proud of what they had done, and it was at this point that he suspected Lorenzo had killed before this weekend. Michael Wachholz's body was found by police on the 6th of January 2004, 17 days after he had been left in his SUV by Steven Lorenzo and Scott Schweiker. Officers at the scene described how this was long enough that the body had started decomposing, and that this had removed some clues as to how he died. Sergeant J.R. Burton, the head of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office Homicide Division, said that time was their enemy in the search of who had done this, because over time, memories fade and insignificant details become lost. The medical examiner's office inspected Wachholz's body and ruled his cause of death as undetermined, due to decomposition causing the autopsy and toxicology results to come back inconclusive. Speaking to the press after this result came back, Wachholz's roommate Fred Van Den Abiel said that undetermined doesn't close any doors in the grieving process. It doesn't help me get over this. Police work was scrutinized by the gay community in Tampa, who feared that the death of Wachholz and the disappearance of Jason Galehouse could be the start of targeted violence against homosexuals. Law enforcement did not rule out the possibility that the two could be related and a massive investigation was conducted by the Tampa police. West Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department, and the Tampa Field Office of the DEA. After speaking with numerous witnesses, the investigation began to focus on Stephen Lorenzo, who lived at 213 West Powhatan, a 10-minute drive from the 2606 club where both men had last been seen. The investigation led to several searches of 213 West Powhatan between 2004 and 2005 where police found Galehouse's blood on the cobblestone floor of the garage, along with hundreds of thousands of images of bound, injured, and naked men on Lorenzo's computer, one of whom was identified as Michael Wachholz. They also found printed transcripts of America online chats between Lorenzo and Schweiker in which they fantasized about the rape, torture, and murder of carefully selected vulnerable young men. 
Scott Schweikert was then questioned in May 2005, where he initially obfuscated his level of involvement in the murders, but when pressed, confessed to his role in the crimes and named Steven Lorenzo as Jason Galehouse and Michael Wachholz's killer. Once Lorenzo's picture was circulated, a litany of his other victims came forward, and on the 10th of November 2005, Steven Lorenzo was found guilty on 10 counts relating to the drugging, and sexual torture of nine men. He is confirmed to have spiked his victims using the date drug GHB and then and sexually tortured them at his home. Michael Wachholz's mother, Ruth, was in court as the verdict was read, although these charges did not address the murder of her son. Lorenzo is reported to have stayed calm, patting his attorney on the back and making kissing motions to his family while the guilty verdicts were read. On January 27, 2006, seven of Lorenzo's victims testified at his sentencing, saying that they met him in gay bars in Tampa and went home with him. They all claimed to have been drugged and then woken up naked, bound, and in pain. Some remembered the sexual assault that followed, while others had no memory of what had happened to them. Reports from the time describe the anger in the courtroom. Albert Perkins was one of the seven victims who testified against Lorenzo, and during his testimony, he addressed Lorenzo directly, saying, I hope each time you wake up to face a new day, you will hear the screams of your victims. Stephen Wachholz, the brother of Michael Wachholz, also took the opportunity to confront Lorenzo. You took my brother from me, he told him. That was a big mistake. I wish you the worst in prison. The worst. Lorenzo is reported to have leaned back in his chair and smirked at these comments, causing Stephen Wachholz to storm out the courtroom. The judge berated Lorenzo for his behavior, saying, With the smirk on your face, you deserve no commendation. Lorenzo is reported to have snickered throughout the sentencing. Stephen Lorenzo was sentenced to the maximum 200 years for these crimes, with the judge describing him as a psychopathic predator as he handed down his sentence. He is expected to face murder charges for the deaths of Jason Galehouse and Michael Wachholz in the future. Scott Schweikert was convicted of distributing GHB to commit a crime of violence against Michael Wachholz, but was acquitted on the same charge relating to Jason Galehouse. He was given a 40-year sentence. Reports said he spoke a few inaudible words when asked in court if he had anything to say for himself. It would be 10 years before Schweikert would plead guilty to his part in the murders of Jason Galehouse and Michael Wachholz. After he was indicted on two counts of murder in September 2012, he took a plea deal on the 8th of June 2016, which fully admitted the horrors that he and Lorenzo had planned for their victims. Stephen Lorenzo and you developed a plan to meet single gay men, take them to Stephen Lorenzo's tangible home, and make them permanent slaves. Yes. Schweikert was confronted in court by Pam Williams, the mother of Jason Galehouse. Schweikert, I want you to take a look at this picture, and I hope you remember this, because you're going to burn in hell for this. I don't even have a grave, a body, or a tombstone. I have the city dump with my son ground up like hamburger meat in the dirt. After Schweikert pleads guilty, Stephen Lorenzo is also charged with murder in 2016. He responded to this by making a bizarre appearance in a Tampa courtroom in 2017, where he claimed to be a sovereign man, saying that he would represent himself against the charges and calling the venue a fiction corporate court. The next few years were characterized by strange court appearances from Steven Lorenzo, as his trial was repeatedly postponed because he was preparing his defense. In May 2018, Lorenzo claimed the murder charges were double jeopardy and should be dismissed. He spent seven minutes in court reading a list of complaints and challenging the judge's authority over the case. I ask this honorable court to cease any further attempts to pressure, intimidate, discourage the defense from taking the necessary time to pursue its due process. The charges were not dismissed. The case would continue to be delayed over the next four years, due to the 2020 pandemic and Lorenzo consistently claiming that he could prove his innocence if given enough time to look through records of online chats. He even made an appearance in court in December 2021, where he gave a detailed theory that centered on the notion that Galehouse hadn't even died but left his home with two other men that were present the night of December 19, 2003. 
Then finally, six years after he was charged with murder and 19 years after the deaths of Michael Wachholz and Jason Galehouse, in December of 2022, Stephen Lorenzo made a dramatic court appearance where he submitted a 147-page motion pleading guilty to both counts of murder and asking the judge for the death penalty. He claimed that he had been planning to plead guilty all along, but he wanted to fully review his case first. Also, bizarrely requesting that some of the witnesses' testimony and tapes be banned from his sentencing, although both would presumably serve as evidence to convince a judge of the guilty verdict he claimed to seek. He also claimed that the circumstances of Galehouse's death were different to how Schweiker had described it, that there were two other men present that night and Galehouse had agreed to being recorded on video participating in group sex. He describes how things got rough and out of hand during a sexual encounter between Galehouse and Schweiker, and that everyone had decided together that Galehouse couldn't be allowed to leave. Unsurprisingly, both Lorenzo and Schweiker claimed that the other was responsible for the decision to kill Galehouse and dismember his body. In February 2023, Stephen Lorenzo appeared in court for his murder sentencing. During the prosecutor's opening statement, Lorenzo can be seen smiling as old messages between him and Schweiker are read to the court. Let's violate the world. Let's bring our fantasies to realities. I'm extreme, calculated, and love it. Easy to make them vanish with no link to us in the least. Easier to find a loner guy, less connection. I do a choke hold from behind. You hold him down, strap him up, not to be found again. He wasn't going to be going back. These are quotes from America Online instant messages between Master Scott, whom we now know is Scott Schweikert, and Dom Dude for Sub, who we now know is Steven Lorenzo. The prosecutor also revealed details that illustrated the amount of planning that had gone into the murders, which she used to outline the depravity of the crimes as she asked the judge for the death penalty. You will learn that Mr. Wachholz as I mentioned, was killed on December the 21st. That is the Sunday morning before Christmas in 2003. Christmas was a very important time and was specifically chosen by Mr. Schweiker and Mr. Lorenzo because losing a loved one at Christmas time would cause the families even more pain. Pain is what Pam Williams, the mother of Jason Galehouse, and Ruth Wachholz, the mother of Michael, have suffered for the last 20 Christmases. These two mothers, one of whom did not have a body to bury, doesn't have a grave to visit, have been delayed justice and denied justice for almost 20 years. And now is their moment to get justice. The state of Florida stands before your honor today to humbly ask you to impose the ultimate, the harshest, the most severe punishment allowed by the laws of this state, a sentence that is ultimately carried out by the governor and by the warden of the Florida State Prison. We ask you to sentence Stephen Lorenzo to death. Bizarrely, Lorenzo responded to this opening statement by saying that everything was a lie constructed by Schweiker and that the prosecution were twisting the facts to make him look bad. But he didn't mind because he was seeking the death penalty. Um, that's a wonderful story. It's a very dramatic story, but it's a lie. It's a lie. Mr. Schweiker made up this story and I made it very, very clear in my 160-something page that he made it up to his peas, this the state because he was hoping he was going to walk from this case. So he, so he was hoping that he could talk his way out of it, and so he, he gave them the story that they wanted to hear, and they conformed it with the fantasy role-play chats. That's fine. I don't really care. It doesn't bother me, because the defense wants the death penalty. The defense is saying, yes, give me the death penalty. That is absolutely great. That's exactly what I want. I'm 64 years old. It can take, I could be on death row for 10, 15 years. The comforts that they get in the death row a lot more comfortable than it is in the federal system. You get your own private cell, you get your own TV, you get your own computer, you get all this stuff. 
but your privacy, your daily quality of life privacy, at my age, is, is invaluable. I'm going to be, I have a life sentence in defense. I'm going to uh, be in, the, in prison for the next 10 or 15 years until I normally, would normally die anyway. I could be in the state for 10 or 15 years before they even get to me. I can possibly pass on before I can get there, but I want to be comfortable. I want to do my time my way. It's easy time. So I'm going anyway. As far as I'm concerned, everybody here is on death row. Everybody's got to go sometime. We've all been given a death sentence. And what the best the state can do is give me euthanasia. And that's how I see it, it's euthanasia. It's by choice. That's what I want to do. So I'm not arguing with the state. So what I'm going to let the state, I'm going to do my basic um, uh, objections to certain things to keep things fair and balanced for the Supreme Court because I, I know what's going there, and that's fine. But um, I'm really not going to try to counter their false claims. That's a false claim. They're twisting the facts. They're twisting it all around. And you know, that's, that's their job to do it. That's fine. But I'm not going to counter it because I want this court to make me think I'm the worst thing on two feet. I want them to con sit, con con continue sit that because the more they think I'm the bad guy, the more further I'm going to the chance I'm going to get the death penalty. So I'm not going to try to argue that. I'm not going to try to counter it, even though it's so twisted, it is, I'm beside myself. But, because, but I expect that. I put in what exactly happened that night on that document. I did that on purpose because I knew this was coming. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sit there and argue and try to change it because I want you to believe it. Go ahead, believe it, I, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But I want you to see what really transpired because that is fair to let you know exactly what happened. So I'm not gonna counter it. I appreciate the state, that's fine. It was very dramatic, it was very good. But um, I just wanna let you know that I'm in sync with the state. I have no issue with the state. I want the death penalty. And that's how I leave it, thank you. The court then heard from Scott Schweikert as his 2016 plea had stated that he would testify truthfully against Lorenzo relating to the murders. He confirmed that even in their conversations before meeting, they had discussed kidnapping, keeping, training, torturing, possibly selling off and disposing of an individual, with disposing of being a reference to murder. You, you've mentioned that you were put together because of similar interests. Did, did the chats uh, confirm uh, similar interests between you and Steven Lorenzo? They did. Okay. And, and how, what were your interests that coincided with or went along with Steven Lorenzo as it relates eventually to your eventually meeting Jason Galehouse and Michael Walkholz? Well, we had been talking online through the innocent message about kidnapping, keeping, training, torturing, uh, possibly selling off, and if we could sell off, uh, disposing of an individual. When you use the term disposing of, what do you mean? Murder. Obviously, the, the chats will speak for themselves. They're in evidence. Uh, uh, but is it fair to say that those chats... Uh, in Exhibit 3, describe different potential scenarios uh, uh, with the ultimate objective as you described? Yes, yes. We had uh, bounced different scenarios back and forth uh, with different ways to take a uh, submissive either with his will or without his will. Uh, what we would do with him, where we would keep him, uh, and you know, what we would do with him when he was trained. When you say trained, what do you mean by that in the context of your conversations with Mr. Lorenzo? Uh, training him as either a slave or a bondage submissive. Schweikert recalled the O'Rourke incident and detailed another time that he and Lorenzo had met in Orlando to scope out potential submissives before the murder of Jason Galehouse. He described that their mindset before the first murder was one of no hesitation, that they wanted to push each other and planned to kidnap and kill somebody that night. He describes Lorenzo's demeanor during the dismemberment of Gale House as methodical, like he'd done it before, and shared grisly details about dumping the body parts around Tampa. That's when he wanted to start distributing the body parts. By this time, it's probably... Oh, 
three, maybe a little after, uh, and uh, we get into his vehicle and we start driving around the city looking for dumpsters. Uh, first place he stops is a little uh, white church, uh, like a little schoolhouse. And I says, I'm not, I'm not dropping a body part in, in, a, in a church's dumpster. I'm, I'm not doing that. And he says, okay, all right, so we moved on. And uh, he just drive around. I guess uh, there's a lot of neighborhoods uh, throughout Tampa that, at that time anyway, uh, had dumpsters randomly throughout their neighborhood on, on street corners and what have you for the people in the neighborhood to take their trash and dump it in there. And he would drive through some of these neighborhoods and say, well, what about that? What about this one? Or how about that one? Uh, you know, trying to engage me into, you know, the distribution of, of the body parts. And, uh, you know, some of them he'd just point out and ask about and he'd just drive on. Others uh, he'd stop at and either he'd get out and put one in or he'd pull over and ask me to get out and grab one out of the back of the truck and throw it in there. Uh, and, uh, you know, we did that driving around for a good two, two and a half hours. You know, it, randomly around the city. I had no idea where we was at at that point. Uh, just trying to find random dumpsters apartment complexes, down in neighborhood streets, uh, fast food joints, gas stations, wherever, you know, he could find one. Uh, and then he had one bag left, uh, which was he had in Corso. And uh, he pulled into this alleyway and pulled up to this dumpster and we got out and we threw the uh, body part into that dumpster. And then we got into the uh, vehicle and drove away and as we were pulling out through another entrance, uh, that's when I had the opportunity to look around and see that it was the same church that I told him I did not want to body part in the Schweikert described the subsequent attack on Michael Wachholz, even sharing that when he was fetching a sheet to wrap Wachholz's body in, he found Gail House's driver's license. He told the court that he didn't realize Lorenzo had kept it. He described how he saw a missing persons poster for Michael Wachholz in a bar in the Sun Coast over the Christmas period. He had emailed Lorenzo at the time saying that he should go and check it out. He also confirmed the reason for the timing of their killings. The last question I have is, is the, the fact that uh, this happened on uh, the weekend before Christmas, uh, the, that is the murder of Mr. Gale House and Mr. Walcoats. Did the chats contain any discussion regarding the significance of the, of the date of, of... Yes, there, there, there was a chat, maybe more than one chat, that uh, we discussed uh, taking an individual just before Christmas what a mind fuck that would be for him and his family uh, to not have them with him, or not have that individual with the family on Christmas. Steven Lorenzo took the opportunity to cross-examine Schweiker, pointing out that he had changed his story multiple times when talking to police over the years, and even lied to a federal grand jury in 2005. When police first approached you, and you realized that you were being uh, put into position regarding um, maybe being implicated in the murders or the deaths, however you, I see them as deaths and a combination, if you will. My story is very, very different than those. But, uh, did you fully remove yourself from any implication of being part of this, of the deaths of anybody, and that's what you were going, telling the police about? Did you remove yourself from having any responsibility? Originally, yes. Yes. Uh, that was back in around 2005. About 2015, you did three proffers with the state. And in all those three proffers, you kept on changing your story and slowly but surely putting yourself into a more of a being involved in the deaths of these individuals. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Each one of those times that you were doing those proffers, were you under sworn oath? I can't remember whether I was or not, whether they just read me Miranda or not. We're going to swan up. That means we don't, don't testify, Mr. Lorenzo. You can ask questions. You'll have an opportunity later to testify if you wish. Gotcha. Each time you do that, you altered your, tr your story and you implicated yourself further and further. Each time you did so, 
as you got better, the, the profit before means you were lying to the state attorney and to your attorneys in front, right in front there, about your how how you were implicated in this in this crime. You were not telling the truth. Would that be correct? Partially and partially not being totally forthcoming. Okay. Now, back in 2005, you, under sworn oath, you had to be, and a federal grand jury, when you had yourself fully removed from any responsibility, did you lie to the federal grand jury under sworn oath that you had no culpability in this crime at all? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's all I wanted to know. Uh, no more questions? No. I just want to no. make, let them see that he has no problem lying under oath. The prosecutor was quick to shut down the narrative that Schweikert couldn't be trusted by pointing out that although he had changed his admission of his own level of complicity, he had never said that Lorenzo was anything other than guilty for the murders. At any time during your statements to the police or otherwise, did you uh, ever indicate that Mr. Stephen Lorenzo was anything other than guilty of first degree murder? Not once. The court also heard testimony from Jared Perigoy and Albert Perkins, who had both been sexually assaulted by Lorenzo in 2003. Both described meeting Lorenzo out socially, Perigoy at Club 2606 and Perkins at a party and both agreed to go back to his house to continue socializing, but did not give any indication that they would be having sex with him. When they were at Lorenzo's place, they each drank wine which Lorenzo prepared and noticed a salty taste in the beverage. Jared Perigoy describes how this made him sick, and when he was in the bathroom, Lorenzo followed him in. All right, tell us what happens once you and the defendant are inside this bathroom. Uh, I was, as I was vomiting, I heard what sounded like a zip tie. Um, clothing and felt pressure on my neck. Okay, and tell us exactly um, where you are in the bathroom. Are you like kneeling and, and I'm vomiting to the my, toilet? On my knees, vomiting. All right, and you feel something around my neck. All right, what did you do at this point when you felt um, what you described as a zip tie being placed around your neck? I reached up to you know see if I could grab it and release it and uh, started trying to fight back. Okay, um, were you able to get any fingers down into that zip tie or was it too tight? It was too tight. Perugoy woke up laying on the bathroom floor with Lorenzo kneeling by his shoulders. He felt like he needed to go to the bathroom but realized this was because he had a sex toy inserted inside him. He removed it and realized that he was bleeding. He was also bleeding on his neck where the zip ties had cut into his skin. Hearing this testimony in court, Lorenzo took the opportunity to question Perugoy. Mr. Lorenzo, do you have any questions of this witness? Yes, I sure do. Hello, Mr. Perkins. Perkins, go. Perkins. Go. Right. So you said that you met the defendant at the bar and you were talking houses and uh, and then you went back to the defendant's home willingly. You did not go back to the defendant's home to have sex? No. Then why would you go back to the defendant's home since that's the only reason why the defendant would have Anybody come back to their home? Because we were having good conversation and having good talk. Did you have financial problems back then? No. Did the defendant, did I, I should say that I, make it easier for you. Did you and I agree to pay you $100 because your money was low, so to do a bonded scene? Nope. Never. Did you accept a hundred dollars when you left? Nope. Did you come to do did the defendant and you do drugs together, crystal meth together? Nope. I have no questions. Albert Perkins also described how the salty wine made him nauseous and that he was unable to stand up after drinking it. He then awoke, face down with duct tape over his eyes and mouth. His arms and legs were bound, and he had rope around his neck and Perkins described how he pleaded with Lorenzo to release him, but this only seemed to arouse Lorenzo. He described how Lorenzo's face didn't look the same, that there was a darkness in his eyes. What is the first thing that you recall when you actually regain consciousness, but the duct tape is still over your eyes? I was panicked. 
oh, hysterical. And I remember seeing him sitting, um, at, at, he turned me over and he was sitting on the side of the bed. And um, I re just recall his, his face, he didn't look the same. Um, there was not, nothing behind his eyes were dark. His face was contorted, which further panicked me. Is he saying anything to you? In the beginning, no, but um, he let me know that other, he had made other people disappear and that would be my fate. Lorenzo hit, beat, and pinched Perkins. He pulled on the restraints on his neck and and even choked him to unconsciousness at one point. This went on for hours and only ended once Lorenzo dozed off after Perkins had been untied to use the bathroom and not retied, which gave Perkins the opportunity to quietly exit. He says he did not believe he was going to be able to leave. In court, Lorenzo said Perkins was playing the victim and was reprimanded by the judge when he tried to push him during cross-examination. Mr. Perkins, that's not what you testified at the federal trial. You took this and turned it into something 10 times than what you testified the first time. You're playing victim. That's fine. Are you talking hottie 29 on the screen name, or were you? I believe so. Yes, you sure were. Um, on 12-21... Mr. Lorenzo, no comments after. You can ask questions, but don't comment on the answers. You ask another question. Okay. Can I have a moment, Judge? Yes. <clears throat> You're talking hottie 29. I've answered that already. Yes. Um, in that chat that we had together, did you mention that you were going to visit some of your friends? No. Who were the friends that you were going to meet? Josie and Dwayne. Do you know who Josie and Dwayne were in the gay community? As far as... What did they do? What the, was Josie and Dwayne the main drug dealers for Tampa? Uh, Objection on relevance. Mm, I'll overrule as to relevance. I'll allow it. But the, the witness answered he doesn't know. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Were you going to an after hours party with Josie and Dwayne to have a drug party and sex party with uh, the defendant? No. Did you go to the defendant's house to have sex with the defendant after we did some drugs at the bar? No. I have no more further questions. Thank you. The court then heard from Ruth Wachholz, who gave a heartbreaking and emotional statement about her son, his life, and the impact that his loss had on her and everyone she knew. Michael, what can I say? He was my firstborn, light of my life, such a good kid. Michael was such a good kid, hands down. He wasn't perfect, but oh, did he have heart. He was a friend to all. I even met someone at the airport in TSA department in Tampa 20 years ago that Michael had waited on. He worked at a, um, oh, what was it called, that restaurant? <laughs> uh, Olive Garden, I'm sorry. Olive Garden, then Michael loved him. them. They said what a fantastic person he was. He was such an outgoing, friendly person. Everybody he met was a friend. He just had that extra something. After being in the army and all of a sudden mom decided to move on a farm and milk cows for some reason, it was quite an adjustment for him. <laughs> I had no clue what I was doing, having never milked cows before. We wired up a building, plumbed a barn, and installed milking equipment. But between the two of us, we did it. He would shake his head at me and say, are you sure, Mom? And I would say, I don't know, but we'll find out. And that's how we worked. After he moved to Florida, it was hard because he was so much further away. We still talked on the phone, but to see each other was so hard. It was very difficult to be able to come down, well, come up to Florida, come up to Missouri, sorry. All right. He came and spent a month on the farm, and man, that was so cool. I really missed him. 
I really missed him. There's no way he should have been killed. He had so many nieces and nephews that thought a lot of him. We spent a bunch, a bunch of time of my leave time in Wisconsin when the kids were younger. And then when I was medically retired, I bought the farm, literally bought the farm. And they would come down. Everyone loved Michael. He was such a cool kid and he turned into a fine young man. Michael's brother is only 10 months younger and it was like he had lost a twin. It affects him to this day in how he does things. My whole family has a hole that will never be closed. That includes me too. <laughs> when I think of Michael, which is every day, I think of him skydiving with such joy on his face, which is how he faced life. He had such joy on his face, snuffed out, but not forgotten. And when I think of the fact that he was gone, he actually has gone home and he'll be there waiting in the palms of God's hands, just waiting for me. When asked how she thought this case should play out, she begged the judge to give Lorenzo the death penalty. An eye for an eye. It would be nice if we could have old time justice hanging have them watch the gallows being built. Firing squad, not blindfolded. Guillotine, again, not blindfolded. What he did to my son before murdering him should be done to him, eye for an eye. Unfortunately, our modern justice is not like that. and allows people to sleep, eat, play, have shelter, and be clothed for free. Even after the events of this week, it will continue for a time. He should no longer breathe. My son doesn't, so why should he? He is lower than a snake that crawls on the ground, and if found, it should get his head chopped off. At least where I'm from, it should. For 20 years, he's breathed and lived, and Michael hasn't, at taxpayers' expense, no less. It's time to end this. It's time. Pam Williams took the stand to give a powerful statement where she talked about Jason Galehouse. She described him as a wonderful, hardworking man with aspirations for the future and a beautiful singing voice. She detailed how his loss had affected her family and all the people in Jason's life. He was sweet, kind, he had a good personality. Everybody liked him. When he went in a room, he just lit up the room because he had that charisma about him. He had a beautiful singing voice that got cut short. And he worked hard. He got his own student loans. He came up here for his second semester to do interior design. That never happened. And he just was a wonderful person. And it affected everybody, his friends, me, my family. It's, it was just a horrible thing. When asked by the prosecution if there was anything she would like her son's killer to know, Pam took the opportunity to address Lorenzo directly. Ms. Williams, is there anything else that you would like for Mr. Lorenzo or anyone in this courtroom to know? Yes, I do. I want to tell him. I um, look straight at you. You are the scumbag of the earth. And I cannot believe how you can sit there with no remorse, no I'm sorry, no nothing. I don't have a grave. I don't have a tombstone. All I've got is ground up hamburger meat in the ground because of you, you scumbag. That's exactly what you are. You're, the, you're dirt underneath my fingernails. And you do not deserve to be living Today and even tomorrow, you should be dead already as far as I'm concerned. You put me through holy hell. Not only that, my health, because now I've got stage four breast cancer. I'm not saying that you cause all of it, but you cause plenty of it with emotional strain on me and my family and his friends. 
And I can tell you right now, I am sick of my stomach just to have to look at your disgusting face. Yeah, that's right. Make a face, you creep, because that's what you are. And I had to wait 20 friggin' years to come up here and tell you what I think of you, and I'm going to say what I have to say. And a couple of things are sticking in my crop, and one of them was when you and that other creep said, oh, we'll make the bodies disappear and make the families suffer. Do you understand me? Make the families suffer. And the other thing that's sticking in my crop was after you cut him up, you went around and threw his parts in garbage bags and dumpsters and all over the city, and you pulled away and you laughed about it. Laughed. What the hell is wrong with you? You are a sick person, and I wish to God somebody would cut you up in pieces because that's what you deserve. So now you know how I feel about you. The closer he goes and gets the death penalty, the happier I'll be. And my last words to you, from one Italian to the other, ciao, ciao, buona fatino. You know what that means? Goodbye, good luck, and this mother's out to get her revenge. Then, in a car crash moment, Steven Lorenzo took the stand to talk through the 147-page motion that he had submitted in 2022. He repeatedly refused to answer the questions on his own written statements and tried to argue that the lawyer was acting in bad faith by asking the questions. The first one you wrote is the defendant has no significant history of prior criminal activity. Is that correct? I'm not going to answer that. You won't answer whether or not you wrote in your own handwriting, number one, the defendant has no significant history of prior criminal activity? I'm not going to answer that. Number two says the victim was a participant in the defendant's conduct or consent, consented to the act. I'm not going to answer that. And technically, you can't keep on asking me questions when you know I'm not going to refute, I'm not going to continue to refute. All right, well, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Lorenzo. But yes. I see the law differently than you do. I think that's why we have this adversarial process. Okay. Uh, did you write the defendant was an accomplice uh, in the capital felony committed by another person and his or her participation was relatively minor. I'm not going to answer that. And did you write the defendant acted under extreme duress or under the substantial domination of another person? I'm not going to answer that. All right, let me ask you a question. As we go to these, um, you say the defendant has no significant criminal history. Having read your motion, your assertion is basically you didn't have any prior history to 2003 because at that point you hadn't yet been convicted of the 10 offenses that are listed in number 9, correct? I'm not going to answer that. So I, I don't know why you keep on going. Once all the testimony had been heard, as the judge prepared to hand down his sentence, Stephen Lorenzo addressed the court one last time. It appears that everybody is ready to proceed to sentencing. Oh, Mr. Um, Lorenzo, yes, you're raising your hand. Do I get sent to say something before sentencing? I will allow you the opportunity, yes, sir. Okay, very good. I'd like to take me about five or seven minutes of your time, if you don't well, mind. I'll, I, I will uh, ask that you try to summarize it as quickly as possible. Okay, okay. First off, I'd like to thank Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Sonardi, and everybody else. That was part of the defense team. They were absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible. And I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Can I address the state attorneys? You may. Yes. I'd like to uh, let you guys know that I have no animosity against you. You did your job, and you did a very good job of prosecuting this case. So I want to thank you for that, because I appreciate your fairness to me, and that's what I appreciate. In this lifetime, I'm the bad guy. You're the good guy. Maybe the next lifetime, the role will be re reversed. Who knows? But I want to let you know that I uh, wish you all well. And to the judge, I want to thank you because you have uh, had incredible tolerance and patience and fairness to me uh, while I stumbled my way through this whole process. And I want to appreciate that. I want you to know that. And I want that on the record for the Florida Supreme Court. So I'd like that to be there. Um, I'm seeking the death penalty. It's 
in my best interest basically because um, it's a comfort. It's mine. I'll be living a lot more comfortable than I would in the federal system, living on death row, believe it or not. And, uh, and of course, that may sound selfish, but I've lived in a private cell for the last five years, and I'm going to have a private cell on death row. At my age, I want to be comfortable. I want my privacy. That's what I want. So that's what I'm doing. It may sound selfish, but that's the way it is. You live for today. You don't live for the past. You live for today. So I'm asking you to give me the death sentence because that will be more comfortable for me to live out my lifetime. I know I can be on death row for about 10 or 15 years, which I think is crazy. But um, uh, as far as I see it, it's just euthanasia. I already have a death sentence. Everybody in this room has a death sentence. As far as I'm concerned, you're just offering me a euthanasia that I'm looking to do willingly. That's all it really comes down to. And so I'm asking you to do that, So, uh, and I'm going to try to speed up this process so I don't have to wait 15 years, because i got better things to do in my time. The sooner that I uh, uh, get euthanized, as far as I'm concerned, the faster I can get, the sooner I can get fresh myself a new body and come back again a fresh body. That's how I look at it, because that's how it is. That's how it's spiritual work. We're eternal beings. So the way I look at it is, the sooner I uh, euthanize, the sooner I can come back. I've got better things to do with my time than to hang out and spend the next 15, 20 years on death row or in any prison system. So that's what I'm asking for. It's selfish, but that's what I want. So that's all I really have to say. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I don't know if uh, what you say is uh, perhaps some form of reverse psychology, no. nor do I care. I will not consider what you want in issuing my sentence. I know that. After Lorenzo's speech, the judge handed down his sentencing and parroted the words of Pam Williams as he sentenced Stephen Lorenzo to the death penalty. On February 7th, two very strong young ladies testified. Miss Ruth Wachholz, the mother of Michael Wachholz, and Miss Pam Williams, the mother of Jason Galehouse. They are observing the proceedings today. The thing that was consistent in their testimony was that they have been waiting 20 years for justice. Today, that long wait ends. In the words of Miss Pam Williams from one Italian to another. Ti condano a morte. That translates to, I sentence you, Mr. Lorenzo, to death. That is the punishment that you deserve you. for these horrific crimes. Lorenzo calmly thanked the judge for his verdict, who replied by saying, May God have mercy on your soul. Lorenzo replied ensuring him his soul would be fine. Steven Lorenzo and Scott Schweikert terrorized the gay community in Tampa in 2003. Their relationship is an example of how two sick individuals can influence each other into becoming more and more extreme and dangerous. Schweikert had sick curiosities, and these were fostered by Lorenzo who was already living the predatory lifestyle that Schweikert fantasized about. Steven Lorenzo left his surviving victims traumatized by their experience of sexual torture, and two families irreparably broken by the losses of Jason Galehouse and Michael Wachholz. For all the people affected by these horrific crimes, and the death of these two young men, hopefully the end of Steven Lorenzo's life can bring some peace after 20 years spent waiting for justice. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell for more true crime documentaries.